Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. So today we're going to go over a bunch of advanced laning techniques, techniques that I use to gain advantages over other pro players. If you haven't watched my first laning guide, I would recommend checking that out. But even if you're not at the level to put some of the stuff in your gameplay, I actually think you'll find it kind of interesting anyway. As always, everything is timestamped below, so let's get into it. Let's start things off with a really effective level 1 cheese for helping you get priority over the first three waves. So as you know from my previous guide, the first three waves mid are really, really important. If you have controlled the first three waves, it makes trading a lot, lot easier because you have creep advantage and you also have level advantage. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do this. Basically, one thing that people don't realize is you don't have to wait for the wave to be in the middle to start autoing creeps. I see this super often in my coaching sessions, but actually a little cheese you can do is walk up further in the lane if your opponent isn't there and you can start autoing the wave before it meets in the middle. So this allows you to have like lots of push on the wave before your opponent even gets here. So let's actually see. I get one, two, three, four, five auto attacks on the creep wave before my opponent even gets their first auto attack on the creep wave. So this pretty much guarantees I'm going to get priority over the first three waves because unless they're willing to use like every single Q on cooldown for hitting the wave, there's just not really any way that they can make up the kind of like five auto attack deficit. And if they do use all their spells on the wave, then that gives me an advantage. I can take, um, I can punish the fact that they're using their cooldowns on the wave by trading onto them. And also it just allows me to see us very easily because I'm not getting harassed. So First off, can you do this every game? And the answer is no. If your opponent is stronger than you at level one, you can't do this. If, for example, um, I'm the Rise versus Orianna in this matchup, if Orianna was standing here at level one, if I just go back a bit, if Orianna is standing here, Orianna is stronger than Rise at level one, so I can't do this. If I'm the Orianna versus Rise, then yes, you actually can do this. You can walk up and there's no way for Rise to trade back evenly against an Orianna at level one. So actually, Orianna can easily be the one doing this in this matchup. The second thing is obviously, should you do this in every matchup? And the answer again is no. If you're in an even matchup or a slightly winning or losing matchup, this can be very, very effective because both of you are going to be contesting for the wave. If you're hard winning the matchup, like if you're the lane bully, chances are you're going to get control of the wave anyway, and you actually kind of want to push it slower. You don't want to push it quicker. Um, so you would just want to wait till the wave was in the middle, and then you would start auto attacking it, right? Because that gives you a longer period of time um, with which you can kind of like you know, slow push the wave over. That's a longer period in which you can harass. Um, so you don't want to be fast pushing it. You want to slow push. And so the only reason we're auto attacking it so much is because we know since this is an even match or an even matchup that our opponent is going to harass back heavily. They are also going to be wanting to push the wave. So don't do this in hard winning matchups because you get control anyway. You also don't really want to do this in, in losing matchups because if you push to your opponent in a losing matchup, the wave will end up frozen on your side and you won't be strong enough to crash it. So if you're in an even or a winning matchup, obviously you're strong enough to break an opponent's freeze because you win trades against them. But if, for example, I was Rise versus, let's say, Aurelia or something, if I push this wave super fast versus Aurelia and she freezes it here, I'm not strong enough to break it. So then I just end up with the wave in a really bad position. So if you're in a losing matchup, as you know, you want the wave to come to you, so it doesn't make sense to do this. Let me show you an example where my opponent actually is in the lane, but I win a level 1. So if Syndra is Lucian, Lucian normally gets priority of the wave because Lucian's an AD champ, obviously with having more AD, his auto attacks are doing more damage uh, to the wave than mine are. So typically, like if Lucian pushes higher to level 1 and Syndra does as well, unless Syndra is willing to invest a lot of mana pushing the wave, Lucian's going to get priority. Now the thing is, Syndra is actually stronger than Lucian at level 1 just because like she outranges him um, with her trades. You know, like if Lucian starts E, um, it's not really going to do much. The cooldown is so long that he's not going to be able to play the rest of the lane. So he's going to start Q and obviously uh, Lucian Q is outranged by Syndra Q. So in this matchup, because I'm stronger at level 1, I can actually walk up in the lane and start getting a couple auto attacks on this creep wave um, before it meets in the middle. You can see here I've managed to get two auto attacks before the wave finally meets in the middle. Essentially, the best time to go for this cheese is when you're in a matchup that's kind of even, it can be slightly losing or slightly winning and will allow you to get pushed over those first three waves. Even if you lose at level one you can still look for the cheese if your opponent isn't here if your opponent is here you can only do this if you are stronger at level one another thing that's really really important for even matchups is actually auto attacking the wave on cooldown so something i see again in a lot of coaching sessions is people wasting a lot of time kind of like moving around and not actually using their auto attack on cooldown so if you have both people really trying to contest the wave whoever gets more auto attacks on the wave is probably going to push it faster um so for that reason you really want to be like maximizing your auto attacks try and auto attack 
as much as you possibly can. So this means, as you can see here, I'm like literally using my auto attack every time it's up. I'm not spending a lot of time walking around like that. And I even try and use my abilities, um, not just to like harass my opponent, but also to stop them from auto attacking. Like I push the wave, which is like what I want in this matchup. And I'm also forcing them to move away and stop auto attacking. And you can see all during this time that I'm using my auto attack on cooldown as much as I possibly can. Again, you don't really want to use this if you're in a super hard winning or losing matchup because you don't want to push the wave faster in a winning matchup um, and you don't want the wave pushing away from you in a losing matchup but this is extremely useful for winning matchups where they're basically skill matchups where they're even matchups and whoever has control of the wave gets a huge advantage. Next we have a way to use mid priority to actually help you in the 1v1. So normally when I talk about how to use mid priority it's doing stuff like warding or roaming or basing or farming camps. It's not normally stuff that actually helps your lane it's kind of stuff that either just like you know you get to spend your gold or you get to help your team or something like that but one thing you can do to actually pin your opponent to their tower and just like keep them keep them stuck like zero pressure under tower just like struggling to farm is actually to use your mid priority to ensure that you get priority on the next wave so i'll show you what i mean here so i, I push um i get priority on this wave and i come here and so what i do instead of like looking for a ward or something here because i don't have a ward or instead of roaming or anything like this again because i can't really roam bot i actually use my priority just to push the next wave so you actually see here before this wave has even died, um, I've already pushed like half of the next wave. In fact, she has not hit a single creep on my wave and her wave is already almost dead. So it's like, how is she ever going to leave her tower here? Like she can't, she's just stuck, you know, clearing the waves on the tower, especially because she doesn't have mana. Um, so this is like really, really effective for taking tower plates, for just like keeping your opponent stuck in lane. I'll show you some other examples a bit later of how to take tower plates, but you can see here again, same thing. I don't really have anything else to do on the map. So what I instead do is I I try and catch this wave as far up as I possibly can. So again, before my wave is even like meeting here, before they would have even had an opportunity to hit my wave, I've already basically killed two creeps of their wave. So this just ensures that you have permanent priority on every wave and it pressures your opponent a lot because they don't get to access your wave until when it's like basically already under tower and then they have to use all their cooldowns to actually help CS under tower. So this is an extremely good way to use your mid priority in order to help you in the 1v1 matchup. Now I know I'm going to get some angry comments saying, wow, that Syndra had no mana. Of course you pushed her under tower. I can do that in my games too. So I'm going to show you an example here where my opponent actually does have mana. So same concept, rather than using my priority um, to roam or base or something like that, I'm just using it to make sure I get auto attacks and start pushing the next wave um, before my wave even hits the middle. So you can see here that I'm getting several auto attacks on this wave before she even gets access to my wave. On top of that, I'm positioning quite aggressively so that if she wanted to come up here, she would actually take some damage for it. So this allows you to just maintain priority on every wave, keep your opponent just like literally zero pressure, pinned under their tower and can't do anything. Next up we have the Boots Rush. So there are a lot of mid lane champions that are very heavily reliant on skill shots and against these champions you can rush boots, either tier 1 boots or tier 2 boots, and then you can use your movement to force cooldowns out of them and then look to punish those cooldowns, or you can just kind of move aggressively with your boots in order to create pressure. And um, there's a lot of matchups that can only really be won because of this. In fact, there's, um, I'd say the most famous one is actually Akali versus Syndra. So in pro play, Akali is a counter to Syndra, but I'd say for that, like pretty much, unless you're a challenger player, Syndra is actually an, a counter to Akali. And the reason is that Akali can rush boots and use her movement speed to kind of force out um, Syndra's cooldowns. Um, but if you don't do this at a high level, you just don't move properly and you get hit by too many cooldowns or you don't pressure at all and you just like let Syndra push you in, then it's like way, way easier for Syndra to play. So let's look an example here rise versus syndra um, a matchup where i have rushed for boots and you'll actually see that i just have so much more movement speed than my opponent i have like 384 right now and i believe my opponent has um like 335 i think is syndra's base or 330 or something like that and um, it just means I can use my movement speed to just force cooldowns out of her. And a lot of the time, like if you're playing safe and just like letting her cast cooldowns on you, again, Syndra will just destroy Ryze. But if Ryze can use his movement speed to constantly force cooldowns out of his opponent like this, um, 330 base movement speed, by the way, um, then you can actually win matchups like this um, that you shouldn't be able to, especially skill shot matchups. Like I think there are a lot of matchups that are just, you know, genuinely unwinnable or like if you're a player, if the two players are even in skill should be unwinnable. But pretty much every skill shot matchup is a skill matchup on some level because if you can dodge more skill shots then well you can win the lane. Now boots do have a weakness and if you don't know how to make up for it it can be kind of bad. So the problem with rushing boots is that you won't have much mana compared to your opponent. If your opponent rushes 
say lost chapter or they just rush a tier or whatever they're going to have more mana than you and what that makes you vulnerable to is your opponent just spam pushing you in now the reason this shouldn't work on a high level is that if your opponent is using cooldowns on the wave and you have a movement speed advantage you should find it very easy to punish these cooldowns and trade on your opponent because if you have more movement speed than your opponent, it's very difficult for them to get away. And also, it's like, obviously, if they're using the, all their cooldowns on the wave to push, that just, like, gives you free trading opportunity. So this is another reason why if... If you're not like really high level, it can be sort of difficult to get um, use out of the boots because like not only do you need to have good movement and good understanding of how to force cooldowns out of your opponent, if your opponent does just decide to use everything to push the wave, you also need to have really good knowledge of how to punish cooldowns. So this is a matchup where my opponent could just use everything on the wave, but instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my aggressive positioning to try and force cooldowns out of them that aren't on the wave. So you can see that I have a lot more movement speed than my opponent here. I actually have a uh, time warp tonic. Um, before it was nerfed and tier 2 boots and that's allowing me to really just like pressure my opponent and basically make it so they're not allowed to push that wave. So this example here should make it really obvious the Cinder's going to use her cooldowns on the wave and then I'm going to use my movement speed to heavily punish her for it. You can see here um, I'm kind of just laning like normal. As soon as Cinder uses cooldowns like this I decide to run at her um, and I can get a really good trade on her and just chase her down. Also can use my movement speed to dodge skill shots. So if you can get used out of boots rush, they are very, very broken in skill shot matchups. And I would say they're actually somewhat mandatory in some matchups. Um, I've talked about this before, but there are some, especially melee versus range matchups, rushing boots is very, very important. And a lot of the range ones as well. Another really easy way to win matchups is to abuse the sustain difference. So in this matchup here, I'm playing Cinder with TP and Corrupting Pot against a Victor with Ghost and Doran's Ring 2 potions. This means I have a massive sustain advantage. The first thing is obviously that I just have a second health bar. At any time, you can base and TP back to lane um, with a full HP bar over your opponent. And this means that you can afford to trade evenly. If you both trade um, and deal 50 damage to each other, this is going to be in your favor because you can just always TP back and completely refill your HP. Corrupting Pot also has a factor in this because when you base, you just fill up your three Corrupting Pots. So I can easily trade out my three Corrupting Pots for his two potions, um, and then I can just TP back with another three Corrupting Pots. So you can see here that I have a massive sustain advantage over him. I essentially have two health bars, more, uh, more sustain from my potions than he does, which means any damage that we trade back and forth is always going to favor me. On top of this, this is a matchup that I think early game, typically Syndra can actually trade a bit better than even, but you see a trade like this, where I deal like 54 and he does 59 to me. Despite the fact that this is ever so slightly in his favor in terms of just like the raw numbers, this is massively in my favor. He does not have the sustain to deal with this, and I absolutely do. Also worth noting when you're abusing a sustain difference is it's not just the health bar that you can attack. You can actually attack the mana bar as well. So if you're a resources champ, this is really really important if you can push in waves against a champion that has mana problems or that just like needs a lot of mana to clear the wave you can eventually kind of push them out obviously here it costs me no mana to push in this waves and it costs silas a fair amount of mana to clear out waves and so that means just again i can abuse the sustain difference in this case i guess it's more that i don't have to sustain any mana and i can just like unload everything on the wave um, and that allows me just to push in and eventually he is forced to base you also want to look to abuse item spike differences and time your bases around them so so if you have high level knowledge of a matchup, you should know what kind of item that your opponent spikes on and what kind of item you spike on. So let's take this matchup as an example, Ryze or Syndra. In this matchup, Ryze will spike um, and Merc Treads. Uh, they, again, they're very good against Syndra. The Tenacity, MR, Movement Speed are all very helpful. Syndra, on the other hand, will spike heavily on Lost Chapter. It'll give her the mana and AP in order to keep up with Ryze's wave clear, and it'll also just allow her to take over the lane in general. Now. The important thing in this matchup is that Merc Treads cost 1100 gold and um, what's it called? Lost Chapter cost 1300 gold. So that, that means that if Ryze can force a base at 1300 gold, so either he pushes the lane and bases or he chunks um, Syndra out and forces her to base, it's much better. If both parties uh, base on 1100 gold, this is way, way better for Ryze than it is for Syndra. So in this matchup, I was thinking, okay, I just want to make sure that Syndra doesn't have enough mana um, to get Lost Chapter on her first base, and she doesn't. And so when I get back here um, and I have Merc Trez just versus this like kind of random assortment of items, the lane's actually in a pretty good spot for me. So there are so many matchups where this is important. If you're playing something like Yon and Yasuo, you have an 1100 gold spike, again, normally against a mage with a 1300 gold spike. Um, you might also be playing a champion that rushes 
Dirk. So there's a lot of different matchups where if you have a cheaper first spike than your opponent, trying to force a base around that first spike can oftentimes put the lane really in your favor. So how do we get more plates and take our opponent's tower? Well, there's a couple things to keep in mind. The first thing is you really want to zone your opponent far enough off the wave that they have to use cooldowns on the wave when it begins to crash. This does a couple things. One, it means that they can't thin out the wave before it reaches the tower so that the, so that the wave will always be at full HP and can tank for a long time. And the second thing is it's going to be harder for them to use cooldowns on you if they have to use cooldowns on the wave. Obviously, if the wave gets up here and it's almost already dead, then they can probably just use cooldowns on you instead. So you really need to kind of create safety for yourself by keeping this entire wave alive and playing aggressive enough that they can't use any cooldowns on the wave. Now you can't do this on every matchup again because like a lot of the time champs will either have low enough cooldowns um, that they can still use them on you or they're a champ that's like threatening enough uh, that kind of stops you from auto attacking the tower. Another thing is that you need to be really careful where you hug when you're hitting the tower. So obviously if you're hitting a tower that's the kind of like most vulnerable point of the lane like you can easily be ganked so you need to make sure that you have like a ward in this raptor pit and be hugging to this or like you have a ward um, maybe up here and then you're playing towards that side so the two main things basically are to try and zone your opponent off the wave as much as possible so that they're forced to use cooldowns when the wave crashes. That keeps you safe from any trades. And then obviously keep yourself alive um, by hugging correctly. And you can do this in order to kind of like take people's towers. You'll see here that most of this wave only gets cleared after I'm auto attacking the tower. So you can see every wave like this, I managed to get a couple more. And if you actually watch this game, I'm going to link it in the description because it's a game I was very, very proud of. I managed to take this guy's entire tower without even the Herald. So if I actually go back here, you'll see the enemy team got the Herald. Um, and I don't know if you can see, oh, I think my cam is covering it. Let me just quickly move it. The enemy tower is on four plates um, at this time. And if I skip ahead back to where we were... Uh, I actually completely auto-attacked this tower to death. I'm sorry, I just really want to show because I was, I was very excited about it. Um, so yeah, basically, TLDR is just you try and zone your opponent off on every wave, as you can see here. Play very far up. Don't let them use any cooldowns. Make sure you're not going to die when doing it, either from getting traded on or from getting ganked. And then you should be able to get at least a few auto-attacks on every wave, and eventually you'll be able to take the tower. Fake warding can also be a really useful tool, especially if you're playing a lane bully that needs to push up in the lane. To be honest, I don't think this will work out of very high elos, so I'll put it in, but it's mainly because you guys might find it interesting. I'm not sure if a lot of you will actually get use out of it, um, but what you can do is if you're pushing up really far to the tower, you can actually just come up to the wall and then press S as if you've warded. So if you come up here like this, and you then press S, it'll be very convincing that you've warded over the wall and they will probably ping it. Um, and then you can use your actual ward somewhere else. This also works when you're just like laning in normal, um, just like in a normal lane, like your opponent sees you here, you walk here, you quickly press S, it'll look like you've warded this even though you haven't. So this can be a really good tool to make it seem like you have a lot more vision around mid um, than you can. Again, you're kind of relying on your opponent actually communicating it and also the jungler actually respecting it. So I don't think it's something that's really going to work outside of Challenger or, or Pro Play, but um, I think it's pretty useful. And also it's like not very hard to do, you know, like even if it's something that doesn't work that often in maybe like lower elo games, it only takes like a second to come here and like fake a ward and who knows what kind of impact it might have on your game. So guys, that is going to be it for this video, but I do want to summarize a couple of other things. The first is the kind of approach that I took to laning in competitive play. Kind of the method that I approached it with was early game, when we're even, I would look to abuse stuff like cooldown, sustain, matchup level, minion advantages, etc. to build that initial lead. I then try and translate that initial lead into a CS lead, try and translate that CS lead into an item lead and finally translate my item lead into a greater gold lead such as like kills or plates or anything like that. Um, so hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. I think I managed to put in enough stuff in here that is like both interesting and useful. There were a couple things that I kind of wanted to put in, but I couldn't really find good examples for them like in my play. Like I'm sure I have them, um, but I just like couldn't find them. You know, I was like looking through games, I couldn't easily find them. Um, so some examples of stuff like that was I think one thing is actually like bluffing your opponent a little bit so you'll notice that like if someone gets ganked they try and like play a little safer right and they'll maybe be a bit more respect for the jungler so i always found that after someone got ganked you could actually play insanely aggressive and they would kind of still play as if your jungler were there or like another way would be that um if they didn't know where your jungler was like 
normally if your jungler goes in or like bases right it's kind of you should play safe during that time um because your jungler is not on the map right but if your enemy doesn't know that your jungler base you can actually play insanely aggressive and your opponent's like okay this guy like his jungler must be here he's playing so aggressive right um so i kind of like struggle to find examples of that again i, I know i have them somewhere but i think like if i make another video um maybe i'll include that but i really didn't want to include it without examples because it makes it harder and just a bit more yeah a bit more difficult to follow but hopefully you guys did enjoy the video if you did enjoy it go ahead and like and subscribe and otherwise i will see you guys next time